Hey there, gunfighters, aspiring gunfighters. Hopefully the weather is getting nicer where you are. It's springtime. And I thought this would be a good recast. Normally on a Sunday I'll put out a pre-recorded episode that had already been aired before long ago. But I know not everybody goes back and listens or nothing says you can't listen again. This is one on getting started in competition shooting. So if you've been thinking about getting into competition shooting, hopefully you enjoy it. Also, hey, tomorrow, coming out on Sunday, Monday is my birthday. Want to say happy birthday? There is a Venmo link in the show notes. You want to drop a few bucks as a thanks for the podcast or just to say happy birthday? Again, there's a Venmo link in the show notes. Anyway, enjoy the episode. What is going on, gunfighters? Welcome back to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about gunfighting the right way. God at the center, Judeo-Christian values, and real-world first-hand experience. I am your host, Michael Melito. First and foremost, I'm a servant of God and a follower of Jesus Christ. That's number one. I will do a different bio than I normally do. Today's episode came from our Patreon chat. If you want to be a part of that, go to goodshepherdtraining.com and become a patron. But they were talking about getting into competition shooting, and if you've heard my other bios, you know that I've done quite a bit of that. So I'll briefly mention the other stuff that I've done and then get into more specifically the competition shooting stuff as it is germane to today's topic. Christian, a servant of God. God is number one. And he, he alone has blessed me to do these things. U.S. Marine Corps combat veteran. Also served in the U.S. Army. Also law enforcement, LAPD. Also been a private contractor. Been a professional hunter and guide, hunted all over this beautiful country. Let's get into the competition side of things. I did my first formal competition when I was still a boy in in grade school, a young man. Started out in high school. Started what most would consider like precision rifle, three position, NRA style. Uh, It used to be four position when I shot it, but I believe they've changed it. Standing, kneeling, sitting, and prone. Very precise. The bullseye for that is about the size of a tip of a ballpoint pen or like a big period you'd see on on a printed piece of paper. Very precise. Very methodical. Precision style rifles. That's how I cut my teeth. And obviously when I joined the Marine Corps, that kind of went away because the war had started. And I went and served in the war. And it was a few years after that I went to work for LAPD and then... I thought, oh yeah, you know, I was issued a pistol in the Marine Corps, and I'm a decent, as far as LAPD standards go, pistol shooter, I'm going to go shoot competition. And I went and shot competition, and I got schooled in that. I mean, I I literally got disqualified my first match because I didn't really comprehend the rules, and I probably didn't pay attention when they were explaining them well enough, to be honest. I was probably a little bit too arrogant during that time. I got disqualified. But I quickly went back. That's kind of what separates alpha males from everybody else. I quickly went back and was determined and shot more and more and more until I started winning competitions, first local competitions and then state and then regional competitions. What disciplines did I shoot in? Well, I competed in USPSA, which is the big one that I mostly competed in. I did a little, I did three gun a little, but it was quite expensive. And so I did mostly USPSA and I did a little bit of IDPA. Shot those matches as well. Uh, I should explain those for those of you that don't know. That's United States Practical Shooting Association. And then IDPA's International Defensive Pistol Association. I also competed in a few other things throughout the years. I have competed in muzzle loading, uh, The rendezvous where you get together in the pioneer days and, and shoot with that 1700s technology. That's pretty awesome, competing in, competing in black powder. I've also competed in hatchet throwing and knife throwing. I've also competed in shotgun and archery. Did quite well in archery for a while, actually. I should mention I did that before the Marine Corps, competition-wise anyway, in archery. Got quite good at it, the 3D shoots and things like that. Competed in the American... Marksman Challenge, I believe the first year that it was out, and I actually took the West Coast Regional Championship. At that time, I was still in the Army, 
and the Army would not permit me to really go and compete in the national level when it conflicted with some other schools and stuff that I had to go to. But I won the West Coast region all the way from Alaska down to the Mexican border and all the West Coast over, I forget, I think, to Idaho. But I was the champion in that. But I have won quite a few, a few different state-level championships, gold medals and championships, depending on how they title those. Also did quite a bit of shooting in Steel Challenge. I'll talk about those more later, but Steel Challenge is one of my favorite competitions for pistol, and I think the most practical and one of the easiest barriers to entry. I've also competed in the Glock matches, GSSF, and won quite a few handguns in those, competing and winning those in different divisions. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. God has blessed me with these talents, and I try to use them and develop them. Oh, I will say the last formal competition I competed in, I got third in a national championship, nationwide, EP challenge, and that was with a handgun. And that was all pre-COVID, I believe. I have not competed since stuff got crazy with COVID and ammo. So it's been a little bit, a year or two, since I've competed. I guess two or three years now that I've competed. I'm starting to get the itch to get back into it, but as you know, I left my, if you've been listening, you know that I left my corporate job and my general manager position to be able to devote more time to the podcast and give them the attention they deserve. So it might be a while because I'm trying to focus time and energy and resources, typically money, on the podcast and getting it going. But from what I know and what I've been blessed to do in competition shooting, I'd like to share that with you today. And again, the number one thing about me is that I'm a Christian, I'm a servant of God, a follower of Jesus Christ. That is number one in everything that I do, whether it's competition shooting or podcasting or my marriage or anything else. Always try and keep God at the center. That is the most important thing. It doesn't matter how many competitions you've won when you bow your knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and stand before Him on Judgment Day. With that, before we go into today's topic, I want to say if you do want to support, you can go to goodshepherdtraining.com. You can also see some cool pictures on there. I believe there's a video or two that you can watch of other of me shooting competition. I don't remember if that's just for everybody or just for patrons. But if you want to see that, you can spend a dollar or two and, and check that out. Also, again, that insider chat. If you want a tribe of like-minded men, this whole morning... We've been chatting about competition shooting and getting into competition shooting. And again, that's what sparked this episode. You can thank them. And if you want to be a part of that, goodshepherdtraining.com and Patreon. With that, let's get into today's episode. Now, since this came up today, I postponed what I was going to talk about. And I'm doing this old school, just off the cuff. I got no notes. I want to get this out before tomorrow. And if you guys don't know, podcasting is not just me sitting here and recording it and uploading it if I want it to sound good and edit it and do things like that that takes quite a bit of work and it as my wife so lovingly put it the other day it takes me several hours to get out you know a half an hour episode and that's just with the editing and stuff that doesn't count all the other side stuff that goes into it so with that being said we're going to talk off the cuff today this may or may not become a series I'm not sure but Let's say you have been thinking about competition shooting. You've been wanting to get into competition shooting. And the number one thing that I get asked a lot is, what gun should I get for competition X? And that's really not the way that I approach this. The number one answer to that is going to be, you probably have a handgun. Whatever handgun you have, go and shoot competition with that. Assuming it's not like some weird, obscure thing, you know, if you have a Glock, if you have a Smith & Wesson m and or a SIG 320, or even if you have a full-size revolver, whatever you have, go and shoot competition with that. You will quickly realize there's a lot that you don't know, and you don't know what you don't know. And I've made this mistake before going out and buying premium, really expensive handgun. Back when I was, you know, a police officer and got into competition shooting, I shot my first one and I was like, oh, I need a, a better gun. And I went and spent out $1,350 on this handgun and then quickly went back and realized it did not fit what I needed and I sold it at a loss for like 800 and some bucks if I remember correctly. Don't do that. I'm telling you this so you don't make that mistake. Go and shoot with what you have. You'll quickly realize what you don't know and what you need and what you don't need. 
For instance, I started competition shooting with a Glock. And I quickly realized, and this was way back when the newest and latest and greatest was the Gen 3, long before the Gen 4 or the Gen 5 or the X series is or anything that they have now. And I quickly realized that I could not manipulate those controls in my hand without moving the pistol. And you might not think that's a big deal, but when you start getting good and start getting fast, you know, tenths of a second can divide first from second and second to third. And that makes a huge difference if every time you do a reload, you have to manipulate the pistol in your hand to reach the magazine release button. And I'm not talking dry on a range. You may be able to reach it just standing there with no pressure. But can you reach it easily when you're literally sprinting from barrel to barrel, barricade to barricade? Can you do that without moving the gun in your hand and having to reacquire a firing grip? And that's something you're not really going to know until you do it in competition. And that's just one example. So that's why my number one advice to you, if you're going to get into competition, go with what you have. Go with whatever sneakers you have. You'll quickly realize you might want some baseball cleats or whatever. Go with whatever sneakers you have. Go with whatever belt you have. You will need, you know, a few minimum things. You probably have a handgun. You probably have three magazines. I would say that's the minimum. But you can, like I said, go shoot with what you have. If you time out on a stage and don't have enough magazines, whatever. You Don't expect to win the first competition you go to anyway. That is not realistic at all. You're going to win by sticking to it and having endurance and perseverance, not by the cool gear you show up with on your first day. So you're going to need, you know, bring whatever shoes you want to go in blue jeans. That's fine. You need a good sturdy belt. You need a couple of magazines. Uh, I would say three at a minimum. You'll need a magazine pouch. And you don't even need that. You could put them in your pocket, but a magazine pouch is is fairly easy to get you can get a cheap one for a couple of bucks and again you're going to realize exactly what style you want can it forward can it backwards you know maybe one vertical maybe one horizontal you're going to know that again the more you shoot competition you're going to know that on how you move and how your body moves what's good for jerry michelek might not be good for you what's good for me might not be good for you i know the pistol that i've won more competitions with than any other by far but that doesn't mean it's the best competition pistol for you your hands might be 50% bigger than mine. Your hands might be 50% smaller than mine. You may be 6 foot 4 and 250 pounds. And that's not me. And the way I set up my kit may not work for you. So again, go with what you have. If you get anything from this episode, get that from this episode. If you have a handgun and a couple of mags and a belt and a pair of shoes, just go to a match and go shoot the match. You're going to learn so much. Just be polite and be willing to learn. And that is far, far more important. Just going out and doing it. That's far more important than pistol X versus pistol Y. I don't say this to brag, but if I go to a competition, I have, you know, several full-size handguns. And I could go with any one of those and run that stage and I might be within 10% better or worse with any number of those pistols. I don't like Glock anymore. I mean, they work fine. They're they're good for what they are. But that's probably the one I would shoot the least effectively. And I will probably be within 10% of any other handgun that I own. Even the really nice STIs that I, that I carried on duty and ran quite a bit in competition. You know... I might be within 10%. That 10% does make a difference, but when you're brand new to competition shooting, that 10% is is so small compared to the 90% of where is the barricade stop? Where do I have to place my feet? How do I run into a box and out of a box? How do I not break the 180 and get disqualified, which is what happened to me on my first action pistol match, even though I was quite acquainted with precision rifle matches. You know, all those other things are, your brain is going to be so crammed with other stuff that the stippling on your grip is at first going to be inconsequential to you. So again, go with what you have. Shoot with what you have. Show up with what you have. And my advice is, you know, whatever local match is near you, whatever the smallest local match is near you, go to that one. I don't care if you eventually want to become a three-gun champion. Go to the local action pistol match, outlaw match, Whatever it is that's close to you on a Thursday night, on a Wednesday night, and just shoot it. You'll learn so much with whatever gun you have. I don't care if you have, you know, I'm trying to think of a really bad gun, a Glock 27. I don't care if that's what you have and that's the only handgun you have. Go and shoot with that. You'll quickly learn what you want and what you don't want in a handgun. 
I would advise you against this mentality. Oh, I want to go shoot competition, so let me go spend three grand, which is easy to do, on this fancy competition pistol, only to realize that it doesn't fit your hand, so you have to dremel it. No, wait, you dremeled it, so now it doesn't, it's not legal in production division, so now you just have a $3,000 gun that you ruin the resale on, and you can't shoot competition with. Go shoot with what you have. Bring what you have. There's so many rules, and you may decide by shooting it, and here's the great thing about competition shooting. A lot of those guys will let you try what they have. If a stage is over or the day is over, and you say, hey, can I shoot a couple of rounds through your STI? Can I shoot a couple of rounds through your para ordinance? Can I shoot a couple of rounds through your SIG 320 with a Romeo 1 Pro? They'll probably say, yeah, here, have at it, man. It's already dirty. Well, nobody cares. The targets are still up. If the range, if the range master is okay with it, shoot a couple of rounds with it. And you do that a couple of times. And once you know how you move and how you hit mag- magazine releases and stuff, how you do reloads, then after a couple of matches, you may decide, okay, I'm going to go with this and run with it for a while and see how it works. But you're not going to know that. And going out and spending a bunch of money before you go to a match with the idea that that's the best one, that just, it it doesn't work like that. What can I liken this to? What parable can I tell you that has really nothing to do with shooting? Let's say you had it in your mind that you wanted to be a professional farmer. Specifically, you wanted to grow fruit, orchards. Like, that's what you wanted to do. You had enough money saved up for land and all this stuff all the equipment. So you move somewhere, you buy a piece of land, and you buy enough for 100 acres of golden delicious apples, you know, saplings to be planted on your land. Only the next year to realize that even though all the surveys and stuff said they would, they don't do good in your area. In fact, they almost all die because you hadn't tried it out first. That'd be a foolish way to get started into farming, wouldn't it? What if you instead moved to a piece of land, planted a tree or two and saw how they did, and then maybe the next year planted a peach or two and saw how they did, maybe a cherry tree, and see which one did better and thrived and naturally worked in the soil that was there. Liken that to competition shooting. Go with what you have, try it, see what works, see what doesn't work, And then once you realize what it is you're looking for, find the thing that meets that niche and run with it. Likewise, if you, and I realize this about this parable, that I know nothing really about golf. I've played it, I think, maybe twice. Let's say you've never even picked up a golf club, but you've decided you want to compete in golf tournaments. You want to start competing, and that's going to be your thing. Like, you're retired, and you're going to start kicking butt in golf tournaments. That's going to be your thing. So you you go out and go to the most expensive pro shop and get some professional guy to custom fit the most expensive clubs you can find. They're the premium clubs. They're awesome clubs. Keep in mind you've never swung a golf club in your life. And you spend all this money on these golf clubs and this gear and then after a couple of weeks, you realize that they don't work for your swing style or your body style or no way for the guy that's measuring you to know this, but the way that you've, the way that you naturally swing or the way that you naturally do all this stuff. I decided that, you know, you spent thousands of dollars on brand Y, but brand X actually works better for you. This driver works better for you. This nine iron, you know, fits you better. This putter works better for you than this other putter. Wouldn't it be better to just show up for a couple of rounds of golf and try and play with whatever clubs they have on the rental section. Just try different clubs. And then once you start getting better and better, you realize, oh, you know, these clubs, that's my jam. That That's what works best for me. And then you buy a set of really nice clubs. And it's no different with competition shooting. Again, go with what you have. There's going to be so much other stuff that's so important to learn almost be better if you weren't focused on the other stuff at first and you just learned the rules of the road. And I do realize this. A lot of men just look for an excuse to buy another fancy gun. Don't don't get me wrong. I like nice guns. But if you're, you know, one day I might shoot USPSA, so I'm going to go out and buy the SIG 320 X5 with the tungsten frame and the super nice sights. 
Because one day I may shoot USPSA. You just want that cool gun. You're just using that as an excuse. And that's fine. Like, you're a grown man. You do what you want. As long as you're not taking food out of your kids' mouths. Buy whatever nice gun you want. Be happy with it. That's not the wisest way to go about competition shooting. Now let's do a little bit of a transition. What I think are good ways to start in competition shooting. I'm assuming a lot of you listening to this are concealed carry holders. So I'm going to talk at this from that perspective and realize you might be in a different category. But that's where I'm going to start because it's a good place to start. So I think probably the easiest one if you own a Glock or carry a Glock are the GSSF matches. That stands for Glock Shooting Sports Foundation. Again, I have won several of those. They a lot of times have matches or indoor leagues. I've competed in both. They are probably the easiest to get started in. Really, all you need is you could, if you have the Glock, the factory Glock that came and a couple of magazines that came with it, that's all you need. And they design their matches that way. And my hat's off to them for that. Again, Glock's not my favorite handgun, but they really do try and make a match that's good for the top notch competitor and good for somebody that's never competed before. And they do a good job at that. So I'm going to give them credit where credit is due. The Glock Shooting Sports Foundation matches, you can look that up and find a match in your area. Again, it's for Glocks only, so you have to have a Glock. So if not, this doesn't apply to you. But you literally stand, and they'll have like a table, and you pick your gun up, and you shoot an array of targets at different distances. I think, I forget how close the closest one is, but I think the farthest one is 25 yards. And they're pretty precise targets, and that's one of the reasons I like it and do well at them. I don't like to just spray and pray matches where you just hose a bunch of targets at 5 yards. I like to practice marksmanship. And Glock matches do that. And you can literally just show up. And your blue jeans and your tennis shoes or, you know, your hemp hoodie and your Crocs. Whatever you wear day to day, doesn't matter. You show up with your Glock in a box, you set it down and you can compete as long as you're safe. And they probably have the most and least confu- the, the most sensible rules and the least confusing rules of any matches. So again, I'll give them credit where credit is due. And that's the Glock Shooting Sports Foundation. You can look those up. Great matches, great to get into competition shooting. The next one I'm going to talk about is probably my favorite still uh, of all the ones I've competed in, and that is Steel Challenge, because I think it is the most fun and the most practical and one of the easiest to get started after GSSF. And you can do this with any handgun, unless it's some crazy dangerous thing. They even have a 22 division. So if you're looking for an affordable way to get into competition shooting, this is the one. But I've heard this likened to, I didn't come up with this, but I've heard this likened to, and I agree, it is like drag racing with a pistol. You stand in a box and you have an array of targets at different distances. And when the buzzer goes off, you draw and you hit each one of those targets as fast as possible. Anywhere from like 10 yards to 40 yards, these targets are arrayed in different sizes, different arrays. The buzzer goes off, you listen, literally, you literally grab that big iron on your hip and go to work. And the faster you get it done, the better you do. You can just go and show up and just shoot the targets. And it will still be a challenge to you. And again, you can never be perfect at it. You can always go a little bit faster. And I think that's the most practical because for most defensive shooting situations, especially like as a concealed carry holder, probably not John Wick in it. How many scenarios do you see like publishing the American Rifleman where they do the things of armed citizens protecting themselves. How many times were there people doing John Wick stuff, you know, doing barrel rolls under cars and running from barricade to barricade engaging targets? How often was it some thug or a couple of thugs, a couple of evil people are trying to rob a guy at an ATM in the middle of the night? So if you need to grab your gun and go to work quickly and hit multiple targets fast... That's probably the most practical scenario. Not that USPSA isn't fun. It's probably the most fun. Concede that. Three gun is a lot of fun. But for most practical, steel challenge is probably it. It teaches you to get a gun quickly and hit targets quickly. If you do it right, each stage is like five rounds. But you'll likely miss a few times and have to shoot more than that. Often in a civilian defensive encounter are people running around hosing, you know, 40 rounds at a time. Have you ever heard of that anywhere in any civilian defensive gun encounter i've never even heard of that in law enforcement unless the cop just missed and had to dump all his mag he didn't have to dump all his mags but he just dumped a bunch of mags because he couldn't hit anything 
but this running barricade to barricade is super cool. It's super fun, you know, doing low crawls and running and jumping up on barricades. Super fun. I, I get it. I love it. Again, I've won more competitions than I can remember doing that, and I love it. But for most practical, steel challenge. And for an easier barrier to entry, steel challenge. I mentioned they have a 22 division. They also have a 22, they have a 22 handgun division, which again, if you want to get into competition shooting and not spend a lot of money, there you go. And if you are not a handgun shooter at all, if you're listening to this, if you're only into rifles, they have a 22 rifle division, a long rifle division. You just start from the ready position and engage those same targets as quickly as possible. And obviously those guys go real fast because it's a lot easier to hit with a rifle and a handgun. Next, I'm going to talk about USPSA. These matches, I believe, are in every state in the country. United States Practical Shooting Association. They are great. They're what you think of when you think of like action pistol competition shooting. Like guys, like we just talked about, running from barricade to barricade, barrel to barrel, shooting Texas stars, which are like a big spinning revolving target where the targets move. You know, the swingers and the poppers and all the fun steel targets and paper targets. You know, you generally have half a dozen or so stages in a given day, unless it's a bigger match. And you're going to shoot assuming you get mostly hits, you know, 200, 250 rounds. Or at least bring that many. You may shoot a little bit less. But that's a lot of rounds in a day. It's a lot of running, a lot of movement, a lot of being dynamic, and they are great. And they are a lot of fun. So if you want to get started there, I, I'd say that's not an easy place to get started, but I, I mean, that's how I got started in that. After Precision Rifle, that's how I got started in that. The dynamic kind of pistol competition. So I couldn't fault you for it. They're a lot of fun and probably the most physical demanding and another reason I like them. Next, we'll talk about IDPA, International Defensive Defensive Pistol Association. This is probably my least favorite, and I hate to rag on anyone. If you want to start with IDPA, that's fine. They're not my favorite because they have so many rules. USPSA has a lot of rules, but IDPA gets kind of ridiculous with the rules, in my opinion. And they do that because they try and get away from the gamer side of USPSA. USPSA, but they make so many rules, they make it even less realistic than USPSA, in my opinion, because I've never been in a gunfight where there were rules other than you take that guy out before he takes you out. That's the only rule, and however I do that quickly, there you go. That's the right answer, and they've just put so many rules in IDPA. You have to set up your kit like this, and it has to be here on your belt line and so far back on your belt line, and you got to use this much of cover and this much of cover and this and that. And your rifle, or I'm sorry, not your rifle, as I was, your pistol can be canned this way, but not that way, and this and that. How is that realistic? Anyway, that being said, it's still a good, easy way to get into competition shooting. If you're the kind of guy that's a stickler for rules and likes a lot of rules, likes to enforce rules, you know, you live in an HOA, that, that might be your jam. And I'm not knocking you for that. That's fine. It just has a lot of rules, and to me, they it takes away from the realistic side of it, and the enjoyment side of it. But that might be your thing. You may decide IDPA is is my thing, and I really like it, and that's what I do, and that's great. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to like all the things that I like. I'm just telling you from my perspective. I'm not a big fan of IDPA, but I'd still do it. If that was the only match local to me and I wanted to compete, I would certainly go and compete, and that would be fine. One thing I will say, they get a little less crazy on the round count, which I like to give them some redeeming qualities. You probably don't need as much ammo to compete. And they generally keep it in a realistic loadout for day-to-day. If we're talking about kind of a crossover for practical use for concealed carry, they generally don't have stages that require, you know, 100 rounds. Because, let's be honest, how many people of us day-to-day are carrying that much ammo and that much kit on us? I... I carry, I believe more than most, I generally carry a full-size fighting handgun and a reload. But even then, even if I fully loaded my magazines, you're talking about 20-something rounds. Maybe 40-something rounds, depending on the gun that I'm carrying. Maybe 40 rounds. And that's all that I have on me. So these, and I love USPSA, but they have these big extended magazines and, you know, three or four mags. Like, you're not walking around with that, so I... That gets a little bit away from the practicality of it. Again, I still think it's more fun. But that's one thing I'll give credit to for IDPA as opposed to USPSA. I just wish I could kind of 
make one and that's kind of the best of both worlds and they kind of do which is what I'm going to talk about next depending on where you are they have what are called outlaw matches outlaw just means they don't strictly conform to the USPSA or IDPA rules they kind of make their own rules and they probably started this likely for the same reasons I talked about to make them more realistic to make less demanding rules for all those reasons and so they're outside the laws of those matches and those governing bodies so they're called outlaw matches. A lot of times they'll just be referred to as action pistol. And those can be some of the best matches, depending on the match directors and who puts those on. Those can be fantastic. Since they're mostly geared toward pistols, if pistols aren't your thing, USPSA, I should mention, does have a PCC division. They didn't when I was hot and heavy into it, but they do now. I believe it's one of the fastest growing divisions, PCC. Pistol caliber carbine. So even though you might not run pistol caliber carbine a lot, you could use that, and most, if you're running like an AR-configured PCC, a lot of that's going to translate into defensive carbine skills. If that's what you want to get sharp into, that might be the place to start. Three gun is awesome, but I would not advise getting into that. You have to kind of learn three different competition sports all at once, the shotgun, the rifle, and the pistol. And they all have different rules and different divisions and all that. They start in one of the ones we talked at thus far, and then once you get competent with your pistol, because the handgun is the hardest weapon to master and shoot, once you get good with that, adding the other ones on will be easier than it would be just showing up and trying to shoot three gun. Not that you can't do it. If that's what you really want to do, again, just show up with what you have and do it. I don't care if it's your grandpa's old Winchester Model 12 pump gun and a Ruger Mini 14 and a Ruger P89. If that's what you have, show up with it and run with it and go with it. I should mention about divisions, one of the reasons I advise you to not go out and spend a bunch of money on a fancy new gun at first is because until you get into competition and be and or at least around it for a while, you won't even know what division you want to compete in. I've won the vast majority of mine in what they would call production division, although I have competed in other things. But if you're talking just a plastic polymer striker fired handgun out of the box, that's pretty much what you consider your production division in a lot of the different disciplines. So I would consider, again, just showing up with what you have. You may decide that you want to run carry optics or PCC is your thing. I'm not going to get into all the different divisions and all the different disciplines. Just know that a lot of times they don't line up with reality. And I kind of, that's one of the things I don't really like. Give you a for instance, my two main carry guns that I carry, one is an M17 with a Trigicon RMR and one is a SIG 226 with a Trigicon RMR. Both about the same size, about the same weight within a few ounces of each other. Both have about the same capacity. Now one of those would be Carry Optics Division, which is a fairly reasonable one to to compete in for that gun. The other one would be an Open Division, I believe, which is like the super crazy race guns. Why? Because one has a striker and one has a hammer, even though the trigger pulls on them are very similar. But that would make one a completely unrealistic division to complete in because most of those guns have, you know, 26, 27 round magazines. And that's just one example that I can think of. So just show up with what you have. If they put you in open division, then at least you'll know more realistically what kind of division you want to compete in. But I'm not, I can't get into all the different divisions and all the different nuances of all the different rules for all the different sports. We literally could have talked just this long today about the different divisions and USPSA, and probably still be talking about it. So let's transition away to the tactical tip of the day. Before I give you the tactical tip of the day, I want to mention again, please consider going to goodshepherdtraining.com and becoming a patron, mostly because you think the content is worth it and you believe in the podcast. Again, I want to do good and better content and content that you guys want to put out. And these are free to listen to, but they're not free to produce and put out. So if you're the kind of man that likes to help his fellow man and you think you get something out of this podcast, if you contributed the minimum amount on Patreon, you listen to not just the other podcast, just Gunfighter Life in general, you would be paying cents, not dollars an episode, cents an episode, a few cents an episode, actually. I'd venture to say probably less than a quarter, 25 cents an episode. And again, I mostly want you to consider going to Good Shepherd Training and Patreon because you think this content is worth it. With all the garbage that you get programmed and all the stuff 
put anybody down but all the stuff the fluff pieces you see on youtube about how great this gun is and how great that gun is because they got paid to say that or they got the gun sent to them for free to say that i don't take bribes here guys i give you my honest opinion and if you think that is worth something without everybody telling you the next gun that's coming out and how awesome it is and they're all awesome and every gun is awesome which is not true some suck if you want an honest opinion an honest place where you can go to yes it is my opinion but again this podcast what makes it different from others is based on real world firsthand experience and if you think that is something worth being out there again consider goodshepherdtraining.com and patreon all right thanks for being patient through that the tactical tip of the day most people that get into competition shooting will get into reloading why because shooting is expensive and ammo is expensive especially now it was that way When I started competition shooting, I can't even imagine. Anyway, I don't have to tell you guys, if you're listening to Gunfighter Life, how expensive ammo is. The average competition shooter will shoot more in a week than the average gun owner will probably shoot in a year. Especially if you consider practicing not just matches and things like that. If you want to be good in competition, you practice aside from the matches. I guess I'll give you two tactical tips. So number one, we've talked about before, practice with a 22. There's a whole episode about practicing with a 22. Get one that's analogous to whatever gun you're going to compete in. Like a 22 caliber Glock. It'll quickly pay for itself in the savings in ammo when you're training. Practicing a quick draw, you know, you don't need a 9mm to do that. You can do practice that same quick draw with a 22. Save yourself some money. But that's not the main tactical tip. This one's for those of you in reloading or getting into reloading, especially for competition. We talked about a tenth of a second being the difference between first and second. Here's something that will easily separate a really good competition shooter from a decent competition shooter. One that wins and wants to win. I don't care how good a reloader you are, you will have issues with your reloading. One of the ways to figure that out before the match so you don't have to, you know, spend time on a stage clearing a malfunction, which most people that shoot and compete and reload will do. One of the ways that I used to do before every match, my reloaded ammunition, I would take and put it in a pile, and then I would have boxes set aside. And every single round, I would take and hand inspect, and I would drop it in the chamber of the pistol I was going to compete in to make sure that it went in and out easily. And not all of them do. Some of them have hang-ups. Some of them have issues. Some of them don't seat properly. Some of the primer won't be seated all the way. Some of the primer will be seated too deep. Save those for practice. Clearing malfunctions in practice is great. Make sure each one of those chambers in the pistol chamber, and again, literally take out the barrel of the pistol you're going to compete with and drop them in there and make sure that they all work properly in there. If you don't like one, set it aside and use it for training. But do that with your competition ammo, and that will save you a lot of heartache on a stage when you were you were so close to first and you got third because you had a malfunction in the middle of a stage. And even if you have no desire to do competition shooting, that's a good practice for the ammo you want to be premium. Your hunting ammo, your whatever ammo it is. If it's not just practice ammo. Now let's talk about something important. The tactical verse of the day. We already talked about one of my favorites. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. You'll find that in Psalm 144. These are the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. He who has no sword, let him sell his cloak and buy one. Now I submit to you that in those times, in those Roman times, the the short sword, the Roman sword, the sword they would have been accustomed with, That was like the CCW. That was like the carry weapon of the day. Jesus told his disciples to have swords. He didn't tell them to have a pocket knife, which they had back then. They had like dirks and daggers and things like that. He told his disciples to have swords. There is no contradiction between being a warrior, having a warrior mind, standing ready. And being part of a well-regulated militia. There's no contradiction there. And being a follower of God and a servant of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's part of it. Jesus tells his disciples, If you don't have a sword, sell your garment and buy one. Some translations say sell your cloak and buy one. Fabric back then was a very expensive thing. It was nowhere near as affordable as it is today. But think about that. 
a sword, if you don't have one, sell your coat, sell your cloak, sell your outer garment to buy one. That's how important it is. He told this to his disciples, to you know, his close followers, those that were following him. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Men, be ready. Watch and be ready. Nobody knows the day or the hour. Nobody knows what the future holds. With that, men, I want to say thanks for listening. And have a blessed day.